Thought some of y'all might appreciate that. But anyways, uh, really this unit, oh, we have a, let's see what y'all think about that. Ah, yes, wonderful. Anyways, <laughs> uh, this next unit, it's technically three chapters. It's really just one big gigantic chapter for all intents and purposes. Uh, it, it's just split into three different parts. Uh, the lecture we have next Tuesday, it's gonna be part of chapter five and part of chapter six. So anyways, yes, I'm sure for many of you, this happened to you at least once on the assessment. Uh, so anyways, the motivating example here, this whole unit is going to be about probability. Uh, we'll, we'll start with the easier concepts today. We'll get into some of the harder ones as we get into Thursday and then the Thursday after Thursday. <laughs> Uh, so the, keeping the promise, the motivating examples, we're going to use one big motivating example for this unit because really i just be repeating myself and over and over. How many of you have been to an airport where there, where there was, it was a big enough of an airport where you had multiple TSA lines to choose from? That's the whole class pretty much. <laughs> and how many of you, you're like, okay, this line is shorter than the other one. I'm going to go in this line and think, ha ha, I'm so smart. And you're sitting there with your line of three people. The other line has 20 and that one moves faster. And about 10 minutes later, you're thinking to myself, by damned, I probably should have gone in the other line. How, how many of you has that happened to? Yeah, it's annoying as hell. It's called a security agent being stupid. Anyways, <laughs> now... Obviously, if it, the re, part of the reason why, if you use the concepts from the unit one, much of that is because the average time to get a person through in that longer line was way shorter than the line on the right. But now I'm going to pose a slightly different scenario to you where you can't use anything you learn from the first unit to help you. Let's suppose you want to get some fast food. You don't feel like going inside. You go through the drive through That's what most people do anyways. Let's say you have Whataburger and McDonald's. I would say two Whataburgers or two McDonald's, but I think it's funnier for some people who just want to pick one or the other because they like it better, which is nothing wrong with that. Let's say the Whataburger, you got three people in the line ahead of you, and you know it takes about five minutes for any, give, any person, give or take maybe a couple of minutes. And let's say the line for McDonald's, it's five people, but it's about, say, three minutes each, give or take one. At that point, you're probably going to think to yourself, same difference, three times five, average of 15 minutes for Whataburger, five times three, average of 15 minutes for McDonald's, there's no difference. In fact, there is. One of them is more likely better for you than the other, and here's why. With the Whataburger one, we said plus or minus two minutes. The McDonald's, we said plus or minus one minute per person. Let's suppose you just want, let's say you're, you want, you're trying to get to class, you want to eat your dinner in class, whatever, and you just need to make sure it doesn't take any longer than 20 minutes to get that meal. Which one do you pick? Which one can you guarantee or have the best chance, aka probability, of getting that meal in time so you're not late to class and get marked absent for your English class where they think the only thing that matters is attendance. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Here's the thing. We said plus or minus two minutes for the Whataburger. Worst case scenario, you got five minutes plus the two, seven, seven, seven. That's 21 minutes. That doesn't work. The McDonald's, we had plus or minus one. Even worst case scenario, that's four minutes for the five, 20 minutes. No matter what, there's a 100% chance you're going to get your meal there in time. Let's say you're a little bit risky. You're like, yeah, but I really like water. What are the chances that I can get that water burger in time? And what we go over in this unit, hopefully at the bare minimum, when you come out of this class, if you go in any type of line, it can be with the transportation security agency at airports or something as simple as fast food or really any line you can think of. If you ever have multiple lines to choose from at the bare minimum, by the end of this unit, you should be able to figure that out, which one is better for you with pretty quick efficiency. So that said, let's get into chapter four and start doing a bunch of definitions because what better way to start a new unit like do with chapter one and just make a bunch of definitions. Our first one, this is a relatively mundane and boring definition. We'll keep the Bernie Sanders one here just for fun of it. Our first one, I'm just gonna type so to make it easier. The definition of probability. I'll pull up that chat in a second because I'm typing this down. So probability, is the chance of something occurring from 0% to 100%, kind of intuitively. There's, no, there's not a negative chance of something. And likewise, you can't go over 100% unless it is a class with extra credit that has far too much extra credit. <laughs> Relatively mundane, boring definition. Face reveal. Uh, Chloe, come to class and you'll see it. <laughs> Anyways. 
So relatively boring definition. Obviously, if it's 0%, well, yeah, I told you to come to class. <laughs> you emailed me about it. <laughs> Zero percent obviously means no wait's going to happen. Uh, like, for example, if you scored a 30 on the assessment, you're not getting an A. I mean, technically, you can, but you're not. <laughs> on the other hand, 100% chance, you know, if you get 100 on every single assessment and you have 100 on all that, as long as you pass the homework, you get an A in the class. I think we're pretty sure you can call that 100% chance. Now, Let's get to some actual more meaningful definitions. When we're dealing with probability, we're gonna have all these possible outcomes we have. Let's say you're flipping a coin, heads or tails, that's a nice boring one. Let's get to a more fun one. You're playing, say, a game of Monopoly. You can get from two to 12. You can get two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That is what we call our sample space. And I will give you the formal definition of the sample space here. The sample space is the set of all possible outcomes, relatively boring. Now let's get to some examples. We'll keep it easy and we'll just deal with one of those two dice with regards to the monopoly. Let's just deal with one of them, one through six. So here, let's say, now we're gonna go back to the brush. Sure. <laughs> so here, let's go with an example. Come on, hold on. An example. Let's say we're rolling a die. We're gonna use set notation to denote our sample space, all of our possibilities. And usually we denote sample space as set, S sample space, they all have an S, so we use a big nice S. That's a capital S, it looks really goofy, but who cares? And we use bracket notation, this is set notation. You should have learned this from an earlier mathematics course, but if you haven't, we use these fun little brackets to denote our sets. And here we have six outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. We should write them down. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that is our sample space. Seems like the people at, ha at home are having more fun figuring out what I look like. <laughs> Those of you in person already know. <laughs> so that's our samples. Here's the question is, what are the odds of getting them? We all know they all have equal odds, so one out of six chance each. But we can denote the probability of anything in question as P of Xi. But in this case, instead of going back that Xi stuff that confused a lot of people, let's start with the examples and then get to the notation. That'll be a little bit easier. So let's say we have, let's go back to typing. That'll make things a little bit easier on us. Let's go back to typing. Come on, go bigger. Fine, that works. So we can say P of one is equal to the chance of, of a one being rolled. From here on out, if you see capital P parentheses something, that is the probability of that happening. For all other probability distributions, we'll use other letters to denote them to make it easy as possible on you to figure out what is what. So in this case, the odds of rolling a one P of one is going to be one over six, which is 16.66666, blah, 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 blah percent. Okay. Now, here's the question. How might we denote the odds of rolling a one or a five? Let's say you're playing Monopoly. You just don't want to land on Park Place or Boardwalk. So give those three spaces, say two, three, four. So one or five will do it. So in this case, exactly. Well, no, I don't play casinos. The real mathematicians don't play casinos. <laughs> in this case, we will denote or, and we call that the, the union. And we use that with this nice, goofy looking U. It's a really big U, kind of looks like a bowl. And we call this the union. And if you want to put that as English as possible, that's the same as saying or, and when we say or, we're talking about the computer science or, like as long as you have one of them. So if you really wanna make it as clear as possible, you can say and or, so one and or five, although in this case, you can't roll a one and a five at the same time. So we just use or to keep it consistent. So in this case, we can have P of one or five, come on, bigger, there we go. P of one or five, and notice this is the same thing as saying P of one or P 
of five. Those are both the same thing. I'm going to stick with the one on the left. It's a bit easier to write down and is a bit more intuitive. Okay. And this is the chance. I'm going to go back to typing because that's going to be a little bit easier on us. Equals the chance of rolling a one or a five. In that case, that's going to be one six plus one six, one third. I'll give you a moment to write that down. I'm just going to pull that down here for a moment. Okay. Now, we have something else. We might say, okay, what about and? What about one and five? We have notation for that. You can call it an upside down bowl if you want, or an upside down cup. It's just upside down of the one on top. And the formal mathematical term for this, we call this an intersection. i.e. and. Okay. So, as an example, let me scroll down just a little bit, give us some space. So, the probability of rolling a one and a five is equal to the probability of rolling a one and the probability of rolling a five. Again, we're gonna stick with the notation on the left, it's a bit easier to write down, and intuitively makes more sense. Because the one on the left is quite literally saying probability of one and five, whereas the one on the left says probability of one and probability of five. So in terms of, I guess, speaking it in English, the one on the left makes more intuitive sense. And just to make it as formal as possible, this is equal to the chance of rolling a one and a five. Now, in this case, if we only roll the die once, that's 0%. You can't get a 1 and a 5 at the same time. You just can't. So if we only have one trial, then 0% with one die. Now, if we're rolling two die, then you got a few more options because you can have the 1 on the first die and the 5 on the second die or the other way around. When we're doing these probabilities, you'll always be told how many trials there are. So in this case, we can say that this is equal to 0% if one trial. That looks kind of goofy. There we go. I need to bring my mouse pad in here at some point. And this is not equal to 0% if more than one trial. Okay? So. I'll give you just a second if you want to write that down. So that's much of the notation we'll be using for probability. This, this right here, what you have here, this is, I would say, this is more than half the notation from the lecture already, which is good. Get the notation out of the way. So now here's a question. What if you ask yourself, okay, let's go back to the probability of rolling a one. Let's say to get past park, plank, and board, park, place, and boardwalk, you got to get at least a seven or better. And on one of your die, you have a five. So long as that other die is not a one, you're fine because it's going to be seven or higher. So in that case, you'd ask yourself, what are the odds of not rolling a one? Now, you could say probability of a two or a three or a four or a five, blah, blah, blah. That gets a bit cumbersome. What you can also say is, what are the odds of just not rolling a one? And we call that the complement. So... Let's get the text back out. It'll be easier just to type it, save us some time, make it easier for you to read. So the complement of, we'll just say A, A can be whatever you want. In this case, it could be the number one on the die, is everything not A, everything else. The notation I'm going to use for this is a bit different from the textbook because textbook uses A and then a C at the top. I'm going to use something slightly different to borrow from computer science because computer science has a better job of this. And oh, we're going to call this not A. So that little tilde means not. If you want to use a textbook notation, you can. I feel like this one's a bit easier to understand. Because you know, it's a complement. What is the complement? Whereas not A, I mean, can't get much clearer than that. So in this case, in the example above, we could say that the probability of getting a two or a three, or a four, or a five, or a six, 
is just equal to the probability of not getting a one. You can see it makes it much easier to write down. But there are actually gonna be practical applications of this that I'll show you a little bit later. Uh, one easy way, you know, in there, let's say I asked you for the chances of getting not a one, you could add one sixth to one sixth to one sixth to one sixth and do that five times. Or you notice this, and this is, our, this is a very important rule of probability. I'll write it down later. The sum of all of our probabilities has to be one. Can't be less than that, can't be more. If it's less than that, then you have forgotten the probability somewhere. If it's more than that, then you can't do basic addition. So it's got to add up to one. So in this case, we have a little law. Again, I'll write this down later. We'll have a formal little box with uh, probability laws. You're going to want to take that box. You're going to want to highlight it about 10 million times in 5 million different colors and put a bunch of stars by it for the exam because it's going to be very important. Same with for the web work as well. But the general idea is the probability of, say, getting A and the probability of not getting A has to be 1 because not A is everything else. And A is not not A, if you want to think of it that way. You know, two knots cancel each other out. Now, here's a question. Obviously, we can tell rolling a one is completely independent from rolling a five. You can't roll a one and a five at the same time. Now, here, there's a lot of different words you can call this. I will give you just about all the ones that I have seen in the textbook and online and blah, blah, blah. So independent is the same thing as saying this joint, which is the same thing as saying mutually exclusive. And this is an event happening, or one event happening, has no bearing on the odds of another event happening. So just because we roll a one on that first die, that doesn't mean we're not gonna roll one on the second die. Doesn't mean we have increased chances, doesn't matter. That's known as the gambler's fallacy. For those of you in chat who were talking about going to Vegas, that's one thing to help you out. Just because the dealer keeps pulling out aces, that doesn't mean there's not going to be more aces in the future. It has no impact on the remainder. And so, therefore, dependent is the opposite. So, one event happening changes. the odds of another happening. So for example, let's say I had a deck of cards, 52 cards, you know, 13 clubs, 13 spades, 13 diamonds, 13 hearts. And I asked you what the odds were of getting a heart. 13 over 52, one over four. Now let's suppose we draw a card and it's the ace of clubs. And then I ask you, now what are the odds of getting a club if I don't put that ace back in there? Well, with the ace not back in there, we have 51 cards total, but now only 12 of them are clubs. 12 over 51, the odds have changed. So if we have multiple trials in the case of picking cards without replacement, drawing any of those cards changes the odds of drawing any of the other cards on the next round. On the other hand, if I take that ace of clubs and I put it back in the deck, the probabilities don't change, now it's independent. You'll see one of those was replacement, the other was no replacement. You're gonna see as we get into chapter five, we have two entirely, dist entirely different distributions for each of those. Now, the good news there, we only have one more definition before we can actually start getting to the laws that you're gonna to wanna to put in your big fat box along with a couple of visuals. Our last one, we have this definition of a dependent. Obviously, if it's independent, the probabilities don't change, so we, do, we just go with what we start with. But let's suppose they do change, and we ask ourselves, okay, they change, what are they? We have a term for this, and we call this conditional probability. And we have notation for this, we call this P, you know, stick with our P notation, P of A given B. That little bar means given, A given B. And so in English, we'll put that in English, that is the chance of A happening, assuming that B has occurred. And as a note, you could put A given not B, you could put A bar not B, and that would be the same as saying the chance of A happening, assuming B didn't happen. You can go both ways, doesn't matter. So I'll give you just a second to write that down. 
we are actually quite a bit of a ways through the material already, which is good. So now before we continue, are there any questions either in person or over Zoom about this notation and these definitions we've introduced? Yes. Yes. So the conditional probability is equal to P of A bar, that bar is just a straight line, B. And what P A bar B means is the probability of A happening given B. So for example, let's go back to the example of the rolling the dice. Let's say on the first die roll, I roll a one, and then I roll it again. What are the odds of getting a five given that I rolled a one? They're the same as before. It has no impact. on So to give an example, um, we could say P of one given five is equal to the probability of rolling a one given we just rolled a five. So let's say we reroll that die twice. We roll a one on the first one. We can still roll a five on the next one or a one or two, three, four, five, six. They all have the same chance. So in this case, you'll notice this probability is not going to change. Whether or not rolling that five happened didn't matter. The probability stays the same. And this is where, you don't have to write this down, but this is where the gambler's fallacy comes from. A lot of people who have played craps in Vegas, the craps keeps rolling 30s and 30s and 30s. They're like, oh, this 10 is getting ready to happen. No, it's not. That 30 being rolled has no impact on whether or not that 10 comes up. Doesn't mean a single thing. Just... That's, that's the gambler's fallacy. Just because one event happens over and over and over and over and over again, that doesn't mean the other event's getting ready to happen. Or think of it like flipping a coin. You flip a coin 10 times, and every single time you get ahead, that doesn't mean the next time's going to be a tail. If anything, you might think to yourself, this might not be a fair coin. Maybe it's going to be heads again. So the, the conditional probability is where the gambler's fallacy comes from. So before I continue, any... Yes, the orange property is our best. Good job. <laughs> Any questions? No, uh, everything applies to everything. This probability, all this applies to everything. Pretty much everything you can think of. For example, what are the odds of you showing up to class today if you got a 50 on the assessment? For some of you who emailed me, it's probably pretty high. <laughs> For some of you who didn't, they're probably still at home <laughs> and not paying attention whatsoever. So... <laughs> It can apply to approach anything you want. Or for example, go back to that Whataburger example. Let's say that first person takes seven minutes. Second person takes seven minutes. There's a pretty good chance Whataburger fiddling their thumbs and taking forever to make those burgers. It's probably more likely that what's happening here is the person making the burgers is kind of stupid. So it's going to take longer. So that's another example of conditional probability beyond just cards. So now with that said, let us now refer to some actual pictures. Make things a bit, for some people are visual people, so let's go to some visuals. Let's go about the simplest example you can think of, flipping a coin, it could be heads or tails. This is the classic example, mostly because it's sarcastically easy to understand. We'll start with the easy one, then we'll get to the harder ones later. This is a tree diagram. We just list out our options. I'll zoom in a little bit so it's easier to see for those of you who are having a hard time seeing it. We flip the coin once, it can be head or tails. If it lands on its side, you just jump out the window. So let's assume it's a head or a tail. So our first option, we could have a head. Second one, it could be a tail. Now let's suppose we get a head, we flip it again. It could be a head or it could be a tail. So let's say we flip a head a second time. We flipped two heads, two heads is our outcome. Now let's say instead we flip a tail. We had a head, then we have a tail. So we have a head and then a tail. Same process with below. Now, this itself doesn't make it any easier to figure out the probabilities. It just makes it a bit easier on you to visualize what are all the possible outcomes. So if you're having trouble figuring out what's going on with the probability problem, if you're able to visualize the tree diagram, you can do that. Now, the tree diagram, it only works if you have multiple trials. Now, let's go to a Venn diagram. Y'all have seen Venn diagrams many, many times before. I'm not going to explain what a Venn diagram is because you probably learned that all the way back in third grade or something. <laughs> But I'm gonna use these Venn diagrams to explain those concepts I just gave you in a different light. Let's start with the complement. So let's suppose, say we're rolling that one. This A could be the odds of rolling a one. And this big rectangle 
can be everything we have. Obviously, A is going to have to be inside that. A can't be outside of that because otherwise, then we couldn't roll a one in the first place because it's not on the die. So for example, let's say we had a six-sided die, one, two, three, four, five, six, and I asked you the odds of rolling a seven. Zero. Why? Because the seven is out there. Doesn't matter. You can't roll it. I mean, technically it exists, but it's out there. It's not in our sample space. So in this case, our event A, that could be the one. Everything outside of A, we call that not A. There's that little tilde. And so this, this can be two, three, four, five, and six. And you can clearly notice we add these two together, we get the whole sample space, which is one. So this is a visual explaining why the, the probability of getting A or a one and the probability of not getting a one has to be one. Or well, 100%, let's use that to make it a bit easier. Now, you don't have to write this down. It's mostly a visual if it helps you understand the concept better. Now, let's go to, and which one do I want to do here? Let's go this one. Or the odds of getting in, uh, say, a one or a five. So we'll call this the one, and we'll call this the five. Now, in this case, there's an overlap, but as a practical matter, there shouldn't be. So in fact, the better one we can use, I believe was the one over here. This one, this is better. One or five. In this case, we add them together. This is an example of the independent stuff. They have no overlap. You can't get them both at the same time unless you're rolling multiple dice. On the other hand, let's say we were rolling multiple dice. Now we can use this one, one and five. Now, if I asked you the odds of getting a one, or a five, so you can say and or if you want. If it makes it easier on you, you can change or to be and or, it's up to you. Notice there's a chance we only roll the one. That's gonna be this little area in here. And there's a chance of rolling only a five. That's gonna be this little one in here. But there's a chance we get both, and that's this overlap. So in that sense, this entire thing is our union, and this little thing in the middle that is our intersection. So that's another visual. It's another visual of explaining the intersection, the unions. Now you might ask, okay, what if I goof up and I flip the, the U and the upside down U? Here's the easy way to remember, union, U. Easy as that, <laughs> little, little phonic for you. As long as you can associate or with union and union with U, then therefore intersection has to be the other. Now, there's an example of the and, that one, that's the and. So we can call that our intersection and. Now the conditional probability, here's an example of the conditional probability. Let's say we're rolling those two dice. We wanna know if we can get a one or a five. So we'll, we'll say this is our one and that's our five. But now we're told we rolled a five. We're told that we rolled a five. So we know our remaining one has to come from this, has to come from there. We can't roll a two and a four at this point because we already have the five. So and this is where the conditional probability comes in. We're asking what are the odds of getting in here given that we're in here? Now, in the case of rolling the dice, the probability stays the same. Sure, we shrank down the sample space a lot, but we also shrank down the odds of rolling at least one one a lot. So, there are a few visuals explaining what's going on with those laws and whatnot. Before we continue, are there any questions about the notation or the concepts of these before we get to the big fun, fancy fun box? All right, let's get to the big fun box. This one, you should box it, put it on your cheek cheek, Surround it with 10 million cutouts of stars if you so desire. You will need this for the exam. You will need it for the assessment. You cannot get better than a 50 on the exam without this box. So we're going to call this our probability laws. And I'm going to write this all out. OK, here we go. Here are our probability laws. The probability of getting A or B is equal to the probability of A happening plus the probability of B happening minus the probability of A and B happening. 
I'll give you just a second to write that down, then I'll answer a question I'm sure many of you probably have. Now, you might be asking yourself, where'd that and come from? We don't care about the and, we only care about the or. Where'd the and come from? Let's go back to that picture of A or B, right up here. When we add these two together, here's what's gonna happen. This gets counted once. This gets counted once. This gets counted twice. We can't count it twice. We can only count it once. But when we add P of A and P of B, we added that overlap twice. So we have to subtract that overlap once so that we don't double count. So that's where that, that extra and comes from. Okay? That's where the and comes from. Now, notice you can go both ways. You can say probability of A and B is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A or B. You can rearrange this as much as you want. You can rearrange it however you want. Now, the next one will do the conditional probability. The probability of A given B, so the odds of A happening given that B happened, is equal to the probability of A and B happening divided by the probability of B happening. I'll give you a second to write that down and I'll go back to the Venn diagram to explain why that's the case. Okay, I'm gonna scroll up here. Here's our conditional probability. The A and the B part makes sense. Yo, we, for start, we have to start with the A and B because we're asking the odds of A and B. Here's the cash or A given B. Because obviously if B happens and we're asking what the odds of A are happening given B, that's implying we're asking both of them happening. Here's the catch though. Since B happened, we can't have say a one and a four. Can't have that because we already have a five. The five has to be included. So therefore our sample space just got much smaller. So for example, if the odds of a five happening on a loaded die were 50%, and we rolled a five on the first one, half of all the outcomes are gone. So we have to divide by that 50% to get our new sample space. So in effect, we're asking, to put it in geometric terms, we're asking what is the area of this A and B of that entire circle P of B. That's why we're dividing by the P of B. Next one, let's get to the easier ones. Now, the next one, we'll deal with our complements. The probability of A happening plus the probability of A not happening must be equal to one. You know, that was the visual. I'll, I'll go back to that visual and show it again just for reinforcement, but I'll give you a sec to write this down. If you wanna use A complement with a little C in the top right, that's up to you, it's your choice. I like using the tilde because it makes the English just about as clear as it can be. If you're a computer science major and you're used to using the exclamation point instead of the tilde, you can do that as well. Pick whatever's best for you. I'm just gonna use the tilde for the sake of explaining. And just to show the sample of it, you can see if we add the white circle with the blue area, we're gonna get that big blue rectangle. Pretty straightforward. And the last one, we're gonna, remember the summation notation. We talked about that summation notation. The sum of all of our probabilities, and here I'm gonna use the I to indicate we add up all the probabilities, not just one. The sum of all of our probabilities must be one. Can't be less, because that means you missed one. Can't be more, because that means you can't do math. <laughs> And with that, those are the four key ones. And then I'm gonna give you two shortcuts. So now we will do a couple of shortcuts. We have a question. Let's start with the die. One, two, three, four, five, six. The odds of rolling a one are one out of six. The odds of rolling a two are one out of six. The odds of rolling a three are one out of six. Odds of rolling a four, one out of six. Odds of rolling a five, 
One out of six, odds of rolling a six, one out of six. One six plus one six plus one six, three more times, you get six six, which is one. Yeah. Pardon? Yes, the entire area as a proportion of itself has to be one. Like if our whole area was 500 square meters, that's 500 square meters out of 500 square meters. So that's why it always has to be one. If it's less than one, you've forgotten something somewhere. Correct, that is correct. With decimals, you could have say point one six 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 plus point one six 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 blah 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 add them all up and you get one yes in percentages it's a hundred percent but here we're saying a hundred percent and one same thing so if it helps we can say that is a hundred percent if it makes it a little bit easier on you you can put that now Let's get to the two shortcuts. Technically, these two shortcuts, you can get them from these four laws, but I'll save you some time and tell you them now. These laws, they don't care if our events are independent or dependent of each other. They don't care. For our conditional probability, if they're independent of each other, then that P of A given B it doesn't change anything. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give you a couple of shortcuts if we assume or you figure out that your events in question are independent. So here, I'll write this down. Let me minimize this. Shortcuts. If A and B, notice I'm using the and as an ampersand, so I'm clearly distinguishing this from the probability and. So if A and B are independent of each other. Come on, there we go. So I'm gonna give you a couple of shortcuts if they're independent of each other. If they're independent, here's our first shortcut. Shortcut number one, the probability of A and B is equal to P of A times P of B. This is for multiple trials. This is multiple trials. So multiple multiple trials. So we'll go back to rolling the die. The odds of rolling a one and then a six, so one and six on those two die at the same time, one six times one six, that's 136, but you can do it forwards or backwards, so one out of 18. No. Yes, that's, that's a P. Let me, make, let me make that a bit clear. Uh, let's just make this as clear and easy as possible. There we go. P of A times P of B. And our other one, so two, the probability of A or B is equal to P A plus P B. The reason why that's the case, we recall if they're independent, they're two entirely different circles, we have no overlap. Because with the overlap, we subtract zero. So we just throw the zero out. So these are your two shortcuts if the, if the events are independent. And for the first one, if you got multiple trials. I will zoom out just a little bit. Are there any questions about these probability laws before we start getting to some examples? I think I saw yours go up first. Yes. One and two are both if A and B are independent. So this one and two, they have to be independent of each other. If they're not, it's not going to help you. Yes. Pardon? Should be able to, yes. Yes. Addition. Let me make that a bit clear. Um, scroll down. Yeah, I can see how it would be a little bit confusing. I need to bring my mouse pad next time. There we go. Uh, anyone else have a question? All right. Let us now get to some examples. Finally starting to start doing some. You can see the entire right-hand side are examples. I'm going to, which way do I want to do this? 
All right, we're going to do example two. Let's have some fun. Just see if you can do it yourself before I start working some examples. See if you can do example two without me helping. I'll do part A and you'll do the rest. So for part A, the probability of getting at least one head, we should need at least one. We can use the complement law here. So the probability of greater than or equal to one head, so one head is equal to one minus the probability of no heads. That's the complement law. You know, it's not making it easier on us. What are the probabilities of getting no heads? That is the same as the probability of getting two tails. Because if you're getting no heads, you got two tails. The probability of getting two tails, we notice heads and tails are independent of each other. We roll a head, next trial doesn't matter. So we can use, if you have it written down, we can use the one where we say the probability of A and B, so tails and then tails, are the odds of tails times the odds of tails. So to use the probability law, we can say probability of tails and tails is equal to probability of tails times probability of tails. The odds of tails are 50-50, one half times one half. So we'll, we'll go back to here. We have one minus probability of two tails. So PT times PT, 50-50, one half times one half. That's one minus one fourth three-fourths. So for part A, we can say the odds of getting at least one head are 75%. Is that a little bit of help? Go ahead and do B, C, and D. I'll give you a couple of minutes to work on those. Do you have a question? Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Let me scroll just a little bit. To give you a bit of a hint, for part B, you're going to use a similar, similar concept as what we did with part A. I'll note with all of these, those laws, one of those will give you the answer, or at least one. And it seems like we should be on track to finish all the material no later than 720. So we'll probably talk about some of the assessment answers after class if you're willing to stay. Yes, it's because the, the board's a little bit slippery right now. Let me make some of these clear things a bit clear if that helps. That's a zero. One. Eight. Tails. Union. Hopefully that helps a little bit. Yes. So the odds of getting at least one head are the same of ne as not getting no heads, right? That, that part makes sense? So we're going to use the complement rule. The odds of getting no heads plus the odds of getting at least one head have to be equal to one. You follow? So therefore, if we you know, subtract a P from the left-hand side, the probability of having more than or greater than or equal to one head is the same as one minus the probability of never getting a head. Does that part make sense? Now, the probability of getting no heads is the same as getting two tails because it's heads or tails, one or the other. So that part makes sense. So therefore, we can say the odds of getting at least one head is one minus the odds of getting two tails. Now, getting a head and a tail are completely independent of each other, right? So we can use one of those shortcuts where we said the odds of getting A and B is equal to the odds of A times the odds of B. That makes sense? In this case, A and B are both the same thing. They're both T, tails. So the odds of getting tails and tails are the odds of getting tails times the odds of getting tails. You make sense? 
The odds of getting a tail is 50%, right? 50% times 50%, 25%. And now that is our P of two tails, which is the probability of no heads. So the probability of no heads is 25%. That makes sense? Do you have a question? Well, much of it's written out here. Well, much of it's, but which part do you need written out? Yeah, it's right here. You want it in English? Okay. Uh, you, you, which part do you need typed out? The part where I explain how we go from, so those, you want how I got from here to here? Okay. So, uh, oh, that's big. Make that smaller. I'll get to the people in chat in a moment. So the odds of at least one head is, is the same as the odds or is not getting no heads. That makes sense? The odds of no heads are the same as the odds of two tails. That makes sense? All right, let me move this up a little bit and make the font a bit smaller so we have more space. We'll go 10. The odds of no heads are the same as the odds of two tails. Since Tails and heads are independent of each other. We can use the shortcut one. And that, num that number one shortcut, I showed you that, that's on your little sheet, right? So we can use that shortcut. And then from there, that's what I already have written out there. Yes. Okay, now let me pull up the chat. No, because the only the only recordings I post are the lectures. If you have questions about the assessment, you should either stay after class or stop by office hours. Yes, what I have right there is that. All right, let's go over some of these. The probability, I'm just gonna go from zero to 100. How many of you think the odds of getting at least one tail are 0%? 25%, 50%, 75%. The answer is the exact same as with part A, and the process is pretty much the exact same. And here I'm going to write out in the notation. You, you're going to have to get used to the no notation, but I'll, I'll, I'll explain now as I write it. So part B, the probability of getting at least one tail is the same as one, this is the complement law again, minus the probability of no tails. Okay, this is equal to the one minus the probability of two heads. Okay, again, heads and tails, they're all independent of each other. So we can use the shortcut. The probability of two heads is the same as saying one minus the probability of a head and another head. Okay, and here you notice I am going step by step by step by step by step. So here, this is equal to one minus the probability of heads using that multiplication rule times the probability of heads. Before I continue, does this make sense? Same process as before. So probability of a heads, 50%. So here now we're gonna use decimal notation. I'll flip between everything so you can get used to whatever you like the most, times 0.5. That's one minus 0.25, which is 0.75. Any questions about part B? I'm gonna skip part C for a moment, we'll do part D. What are the odds of laying on our edge? 0%, 25%, 50, 75, 100. None of you like raising your hands apparently, 0%. Can't land on your head, you can't land on the edge. If we can't land on our edge even once, how are we supposed to lay on it at least once? So here, this is just 0%. This one is not a math problem. This one's a reading problem. <laughs> You'll notice as I go over the assessment answers, some of them were actually kind of sort of reading problems. Now we'll do part C. What are the odds of getting one of each? 
The odds of getting one of each, we can have heads and then tails, or we can have tails and then heads. So for part C, the probability of one of each is equal to the probability of getting heads and then tails plus the probability of tails and then heads. Because when we say one of each, order doesn't matter. We can have the heads and then the tails, the tails and the heads, doesn't matter. As long as we have one of each, we're fine. Again, we're gonna use a shortcut. They're independent of each other, so we can use this shortcut. So this first one, probability of heads and tails is probability of heads times probability of tails. And then tails and heads plus probability of tails times probability of heads. These are all 0.25, so point, I'm sorry, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5. 0.5 times 0.5 plus 0.5 times 0.5, that's 0.25 plus 0.25, 50%. Before I continue, any questions about part C? Any questions about this example in general? Let's get to an easier one. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to do this one. Oh, you think that one's easy? This one's even easier, which is good. So here's this one. I will, you should only need maybe one minute tops to do this one. I'll give you until about 05 or 06 to do this one. Notice the probabilities don't add up to 70% because you haven't been given some of them, but you don't need all the probabilities to answer A and B. As a little hint, notice for part A, that's the same thing as asking the probability of being a college grad and having computer skills. That's another way to word it. Well, I don't know what to do about that, William. <laughs> Um, also, with regards to posting the Zoom of uh, the, well, these lectures, what I will do is I will post them, but I'm not going to post them until the independent study day. So that way you can review them as needed. And so that way, at least for those of that are showing up, still reason to show up. Yes. No, it's not supposed to, because you're not given all the probabilities. But for this one, you don't need all the probabilities. Because all we're asking you about are computer skills and college grads. And you have the probabilities for both those, so you don't need the rest. You'll notice for some problems, you won't be given every single probability. You'll notice like with the previous unit, we, we worked through some problems where you were able to get information despite not having all the data. Like with the histograms, getting the mode letter grade, and the median letter grade. I, I'm, I'm going to emphasize in unit one, like we're here in unit two, and for this class in general, that you don't always have to have all the information to get the answers that you need. So I'll give you about an extra minute and then we'll go through this. And as a little hint, in case you didn't notice this, this is, oh, that is a terrible, let me use the box instead. In case you didn't notice, this is a very important part of the problem. Does anyone need some extra time? All right, let's go through this. Probability of being a college grad with computer skills, same thing as saying probability of being a college grad and having computer skills. So for part A, this is the same as the probability. Let's just say C for, for college grad. Oh no, let's, see, let's use B for college, or like bachelor's degree. Probability of having that degree and having computer skills, this is an independent event. So therefore we can use a shortcut. That's equal to the probability of B times the probability of C. In this case, probability of being a college grad is 40%. So 0.4, probability of having computer skills is 30%. That is 0.12. That's our answer. Easy as that, nothing else to do. 
you'll see there are some very easy webhook problems like this. Like I said, this chapter starts off easy and gets a bit more difficult as we go along. Now for part B, this is the same as saying the probability of having that bachelor's degree or having computer skills. Well, we recall by shortcut, and this is shortcut number two, I believe, by shortcut number two, we can say this is the probability of having that bachelor's plus the probability of having the computer skills. Notice we don't need that minus P of A and B. And you can add that if you want, but that's gonna be zero because they're independent. So this is gonna be 0.4 plus 0.3, which is 0.7. That's it, that's all there is to this problem. Now, I told you it was gonna be about as easy as you can get. You're gonna see there are a couple of web work problems that are as easy as this. Any questions about this problem? Yes. So one of the shortcuts is for the probability of A and B. The other one is A or B. So with the question you have to ask yourself, is it asking me for and or or? The second part, you have to, in order to use these shortcuts, they have to be independent of each other. Here, it very clearly says they're independent. And like with above, it said heads and tails, they're independent. Now, if it never tells you they're independent, usually for any problem, it'll tell you if they're dependent or independent. If it doesn't tell you, don't use the shortcuts. They might work, but the other ones will always work. The reason why I bring up the shortcuts is because it can save you tons of time. Now, this one we'll get back to. Now let's get to the more logic part. This one isn't really covered in the textbook. You'll recall with, uh, with we had the measures of location. You know, I gave you the mean, the median, the range, and the mode, and I asked you to get the original data back. Let's suppose I only give you some of the data and ask you to get the rest. Here, and then you can use this very far outside this class. Let's say you're transferring data, your internet crashes, the file gets corrupted, you don't have all of it. I, that's happened to me before sometimes. Usually it's when we use the school internet because it's not as great as it otherwise should be, or maybe you're using AT&T. So here, uh, I'll and these two tables I will work through. I'll work through the harder ones and give you a little bit an easy one just to understand the concept. So here, I'll let me zoom out a little bit. Here is a plan you can use to fill in any table you want. If doesn't give you all the data. You wanna write down every single word of this. You want to have this on your cheat sheet. This is showing up on the exam. It's not gonna show up on the web work. It will show up on the exam. So we're gonna have this table. Every single table I give you, it'll have a total row and a total column. So there'll always be totals, okay? The first thing you wanna do, go through all of the rows with only one missing entry. Because if they only have one missing entry, it's a system of one equation. That's from algebra, pre-algebra all the way back in like sixth or seventh grade for you. You know how to solve that. Like remember with the mean, we had A plus B plus C plus D plus E is equal to the mean times our number of data points. In that case, you solve for everything. And at the very end, you had that one data point you needed to find, but you had that equation to use. Same concept here. The sum of all of our data points in the row has to be the total. Same idea for the column. The sum of all the data in our column has to be equal to the total at the bottom of that column. So the first thing you should do is look through your rows and see if any of them are missing an entry. If any of them are missing only one entry, you can get that entry. So as an extraordinarily simplified example, let's start with oh, this actually, it could be simpler. We look here, we have, we have one row our bottom row, that's only missing one entry. It's just missing one. We have the 20, empty, 20, and 100. So we know this row plus that row plus that has to be equal to that. So 20, I'm just gonna call this question mark, plus 20 has to be 100. You all know how to solve that from pre-algebra. <laughs> so 20 plus 20 is 40. Plus the question mark has to be 100. It's pretty easy to see that the question mark is equal to 60. Fill that in. Let me pull up chat. Yes, <laughs> there are some, y'all know, there are some people in this country who are very, very fat. Yes, because it kind of is Sudoku. Remember, when I had that Sudoku bonus assessment, I was not kidding when I said you'd have that kind of stuff pop up. You didn't have to work on it but you could if you want. 
I heard there was the one ton family, 600, 600 and 800 person. The two 600 people, they go on the scale and that adds up to 1200. So you'd think the family's named the one ton family, the really, really, really fat person. I think, hey, you know, maybe I weigh 800 because the other two weigh 600 and we're the one ton family. She is not surprised until she steps on that scale and realizes she breaks. I'm not kidding, you can look that up. Anyways, let's keep going. So here we have no more rows. Every single other row we have has more than has two or more blank spots, can't do anything. Let's go to step two. We have a chat, it's probably about the fat girls. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> Row two, now all of our columns with one missing entry. Now notice you can go the other way around. You can do the columns first, then the rows, doesn't matter. I just say rows first because left to right, then up to down. But you can go with reverse if you want. So now let's go through all of our columns where we're only missing one data point. Here, we're only missing one. We should have this and everything else. So we know in this case, going to this one, this question mark, plus four, plus one, is equal to 20. Pretty obvious that the question mark is 15. So, 15. Let's go to our next column. 18 to 65, we don't have a single data point, can't do anything there. Next one, let's go here. We have everything but this one data point. So 10 plus our question mark plus one must be 20. Pretty obvious that question mark is nine. Finally, our last one, 40 plus 50 plus our question mark has to be equal to 100. Pretty obvious the question mark is equal to 10. Now step three says, okay, go do it again. Because now notice, because we have this 15, this nine and this 10, Guess what, start with our first row. Because we now have that 15, it's only missing one entry. Now we can use the rows, the first one. This recursive formula will always work. If I am giving you a table in this course, you can fill the whole thing out because I check it myself. I make sure you can fill it out. So this recursion thing, if you know how to use it, it'll always work. Go one, two, if you're not done, start over and keep going with your new data. So let's start over, back to row one. We have all three of these rows only have one missing entry. 15 plus something plus 10 is 40. That's going to be 15. Four plus something plus nine must be 50. So four plus nine is 13. Subtract that off 50. That must be 37. One plus something plus one plus is has equal to 10. So this will be eight. And you'll notice this all adds up. Five plus seven is 12 plus eight, 20, 10, 30, 60. Those of you that like the fun jokes, all of the really fat people are apparently 18 to 65. So uh, some of you in this room, watch out. <laughs> Any questions about this, the general process? All right, let's go to a harder one. This is gonna be the hardest type of one you will see. Actually, there's one a teensy bit harder, but I work it out. Uh, the one closest to what you will see is gonna be roughly a halfway point between this one and this one. The one that you're going to see on the assessment will have the same amount of rows, but I think it has an extra column or two. It's going to be a halfway point. Let's go with this. Let's use your order. Start with the rows. Our first row, we're missing only the one data point. I'm not going to write all this out because I'm going to be writing an English essay, so you should listen to me say it. So 9 plus 17, that is 26. Add the 2, that's 28. 28 plus something has to be 36. That something is eight. No more rows. All the other rows have at least two empty spots. Let's move on to our columns. This column only has one missing entry. So let's do that one. This one, I really don't think you get any easier than that. You just add everything up and that's your total. Can't get much easier than that. Nine plus eight, 17, plus nine, 26, plus 16, 42. Can't do anything with the B column. It's got too many empty entries. The C column, we can now do the C column because we got the row for it. Eight plus six plus something plus eight is 28. Eight plus six, 14, plus eight, 22. That has to be 28. So our missing one is six. Now I know for many of you, you'll have to write this out on the side while you do it, and that's fine. There's a practice exam where I go over a perfect example like this along with some probability questions. And in that one, I write out literally every single possible step. So if you need the extra English, that one will help you out there. The Fs can't do anything. Totals, yes, we can. Here, 
we need all these add up to 149. 36 plus 35 is 71, plus 52, I believe that's 123. So that difference is 26. Okay, now go back to step one, start all over again. We can now notice one of these rows are already done. Next one, this row, we can now find this entry because we just got the 26. Eight plus this plus six plus zero must be 26. Eight plus six is 14, plus zero, still 14, plus our remainder has to get 26, which means this is 12. Next row, we can now find out this one because we got the six. Nine plus something plus six plus six has to be 35. Nine plus six is 15, plus the six, 21. That difference is 14. Final one, can't do anything. Let's go to our last one. All of this has to add up to 149. Now we're only missing one entry, we can do it now. 42 plus 70, 112 plus 28, that's 140. So the difference is just nine. And now the columns. We can do our Fs because now we got the nine. Two plus six plus something is nine. That something is one. This last one, 17 plus 12 plus 14 plus something has to be 70. 12 plus 14, that is 26 plus the 17, that's 43. 43 plus something is 70. That something is 23. Don't worry if you can't do the mental math, you'll have more than enough time on the assessment to do it. Just like that, table's done. Now we can start doing probability problems. So that is the general idea behind solving these logic problems. You just use the same recursive thing. This recursive formula will carry you through the way. As long as you have this on your cheat sheet, you'll be good to go. If you can remember it, that's great. But there's not going to be all that much to write down for this chapter. So now let's go to that example number four. Uh, what I'm going to do is the stuff about combinations and permutations we'll do in the next lecture because next lecture is not going to take the full class period. So this will be our final example, and then I'll go over some of the most missed assessment problems. So here we have this table. Fill it out using the example. You'll notice this is an extraordinarily simplified example just to get you used to the process, and then you can solve a couple of probability problems. So I'll give you about three minutes to do this. And after we're done going over this example, that'll be done for the material today. And I'll go over some of the most misassessment problems. If you want to stay on Zoom or stay here, that's fine. If you can't stay for it, you're more than welcome to stop by office hours later today or on Thursday or next week, whichever, whichever is best for you.
Does anyone need some more time? All right, let's go through the logic one. You'll notice this one is far easier than the examples I gave. Well, because I'm just trying to get you used to it. You'll notice the rows don't do us anything. Every single row is missing two entries. So step two, go to the columns. This one, 240 plus something has to be 250. Pretty obvious that's 10. That is the widest looking zero in the history of the country. Who cares? Shift two, can't do anything. Shift three, 139 plus 11 is our total. That's 150. Can't do anything with the next total column. Now go back to the start. We can now fill out two of our rows. We can fill out the flawed row and the total row. 10 plus nine plus 11 has to be our total. So nine plus 11 is 20 plus 10, that's 30. This total column, 150 plus something plus 150 is 600. 250 plus 150, that's 400. And to get the 600, we add 200. Now, go back to step one. Can't do the row again. But now we can do the two columns. You'll notice pretty much all these, we solve them with columns. Sometimes it'll be that way. Sometimes you're mostly doing column stuff. Sometimes you're also doing row stuff. Just depends on the numbers you get. So something plus nine is 200, 191. All of these, 191, or actually we'll stay with the columns. That's easier. So something plus 30 is 600, 570. Any questions about that? All right. Now, what proportion of the shirts were perfect or made by shift two? So we want the probability that a shirt is perfect or made by shift two. We cannot use the shortcut. They're not independent of each other. It is possible it could have been perfect and made by shift two. So we have to use our first probability law. So this is equal to the probability it is perfect plus the probability it was made by shift two minus the probability it is perfect and made by shift two. How do we get that? We have numbers. Well, the probability that a shirt is perfect is perfect total is 570. So we divide 570 by 600. So this one is 570 over 600. The probability was made by shift two. We had 200 shirts made in shift two, 600 total. So P2 is 200 over 600. Now, what are the odds it was perfect and made by shift two? Well, the odds it is perfect. Well, so here we look for this one. This one, this 191 is perfect and shift two. That's our 191, 600 total. So in this case, 570 plus 200 is 870 minus 191, that'll be 470. I think 479, I think that's 479 over 600. I'm gonna pull up my calculator and double check. Pretty sure that is the correct one. One moment. I just wanna double check, I'm giving you the right thing. Oh, that is 70, oh, come on. Minus 191. Oh, I'm sorry, 770, 770 off by 100. Sorry about that. I thought that said 670 for some reason. There we go, 579. Yes. Someone had a question? I thought someone said my name. Okay, so that's that one. Let's go to our last one and then I will go over some of the assessment answers. Given that the shirts were made by shift two, what proportion of the shits, sorry, shirts <laughs> were perfect. Hey, sometimes you have those. So, hey. Sometimes it'd be nice to have. You ever know, every once in a while you'll have one, nice and easy, but this is not a biology class. So now here we're asking for the probability that a shirt is perfect given that it was made by shift two. And so we recall this is equal to the probability that the shirt is perfect and made by shift two divided by the probability it came from shift two. So the probability of perfect and shift two, we already got that, 191 over 600. So we have 191 over 600. 
Now the probability that it came from shift two, we already calculated 200 over 600. So 200 over 600. The 600s will cancel out. So you're left with 191 over 200. For web work, you can enter in the fractions, you can enter in a decimal, whatever works for you.